Friends, grace to you and peace in the name of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Welcome to worship from the sanctuary at Shady Grove Presbyterian Church. I'm Will Christians, the pastor here, and our music for the service, as always, is provided by the church musician, Kevin Gray. Some announcements for our community, from our community. Our next Vesper service, evening outdoor Vesper service, is next Sunday, September 6th at 6 p.m. Uh, all are invited to come out for that. It's a service of prayer and praise and singing. Uh, communion is also included. Bring your lawn chair and your face mask and come uh, enjoy God in God's creation. Following that service, we'll have a congregational meeting. Uh, the purpose of which is to reinstate Mary Kirkland uh, into active service on the session and to elect John Ritkalkis to the nominating team. We hold, especially in prayer today, Tom Walsh, Ann Miller, Janet Baldwin, and Susan Baldwin, who is caring for Janet, and Charlotte Tidwell, the sister of Bob Isgren. So friends, wherever you are, I hope that this service is meaningful for you and that you can settle yourself into a place where you are receptive to God and God's spirit as it surrounds you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. And now, friends, let us center ourselves with these words of prayer. Ageless one who created time and is sovereign over its every passing moment, be near to us in these our fleeting moments. Help us to live in the present and celebrate all that is good and all you have accomplished through us to build your kingdom of justice and peace. Empower us also to face the disappointment and holy frustration of the change we have yet to see and the injustices that continue to rob so many of their future. Above all, O oh God, fill us with your spirit, that we might look to tomorrow with hope, determination, and love. For we need your perspective as we continue to work with you for a future for all. Bless these moments of worship, that our hearts might be filled and our 
faith might be strengthened. Amen. And now, beloved, trusting in God's love for us, we go before the throne of grace with boldness that we might receive the mercy needed for this very moment. So in faith, let us join our hearts together in prayer. How can we look at this world and not sing of your praises, O God? The beauty and the majesty of the world is overpowering, yet we tend to take all that you do for granted. We treat your creation with callous indifference, using its resources carelessly and with little regard to the future. We insist on war as solutions for problems rather than the harder road of peace. We turn our backs on people in need, the weak, the downtrodden. They go unnoticed in our midst. How foolish we are, O oh God, and how ignorant we have become. You have given to us all that we need. You have blessed us with the witness of love embodied who came so that we might learn how to fully live. Forgive us. Heal our hearts and spirits. Make us fully aware of all of our blessings and our responsibilities. Give us again a spirit of joy in serving you. Help us to be agents of peace and hope to others. And we pray these things, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And hear the good news this day. God indeed hears the cries of the brokenhearted and renews the strength of those who trust in the mercy of the divine. In Jesus Christ, God has taken us by the hand, forgives our sins, and lifts us to a new life. So, sisters and brothers, know that you are loved, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Knowing God grants us peace, I pray that in your life this day and in this moment, you know Christ's peace. For the peace of Christ is with you this day. Alleluia. Today we continue in our short series on the wisdom literature of the Hebrew Bible, turning to Ecclesiastes, the purveyor of today's wisdom, traditionally to, believed to be spoken through King Solomon, who seems to be speaking to us from a disillusioned old age. Like Proverbs, we don't hear much about this book other than perhaps the quite familiar opening lines of chapter 3, thanks to Pete Seeger's turn, turn, turn. And though Ecclesiastes may have fallen by the wayside in the modern perspective, historically it was held in great esteem. Martin Luther called Ecclesiastes this very beautiful and useful book, which on many counts deserves to be in everyone's hands and familiar to everyone. So now let us open our ears and eyes to discover why the great reformer thought this to be true and hear what Ecclesiastes says on what it means to live the good life. From chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, followed by chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for God's word for the church today. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the teacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Round and round goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they continue to flow. 
All things are wearisome. More than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been in the ages before us. The people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd say that as Americans, we're all a bit time obsessed. And that obsession varies somewhat within different subcultures of this country, but in large part, we are rather strict about the clock. We see time as a commodity, and we are the consumer. Our time is future-oriented, always making us look ahead, and linear, always pushing or pulling us forward. Time is limited and therefore very valuable. It can be spent, saved, or wasted. Spent meeting a deadline, saved by increasing efficiency, or wasted by sitting in the grass doing nothing. Many churches are not immune to this cultural obsession. There's a start on time, end on time expectation. God gets one hour of my time, and then we have to get to lunch before the Baptist church lets out. And this is a reason why many churches have clocks in the sanctuary, and why most of the time that clock can only be seen by the pastor. Because everyone sitting out in the pews, y'all can do something the preacher can't. You can check that watch or take that sly peek of the phone to see exactly what time it is. So the clocks on the back wall or sitting on the pulpit, that's there for the pastor to know just how long she has before folks start a pre-benediction exodus. My pastor growing up had this practice that he might have learned from a joke. I'm not totally sure, but his way of measuring time was to put a piece of candy in his mouth as the service started and let it dissolve over the course of an hour. But as the joke tells it, there was a preacher who was highly regarded for his consistency in finishing the services right at noon, impeccably regimented. Then one Sunday, the impossible happened. He preached, and his service went on until 12.30, and on the way out, one of the church elders accosted him, saying, What happened to you? And the preacher answered, for years, I've always put this candy mint in my mouth. As the service started, I would, I would tuck it away, and it would always be gone exactly at noon. And that way, I never had to look at the clock or worry about how long I was going, have any concern about what time it was. But this Sunday, it didn't go away. And I finally realized that I had mistakenly put a button in my mouth. It's Ecclesiastes is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word koheleth, meaning preacher. And this is a preacher very obsessed with time. Particularly, there's a captivation about the cycles of time and the endless nature of time juxtaposed with the incredibly finite nature of life. 
Remember, this preacher is said to be writing from a disillusioned place of old age. And from this vantage point, gazing back along all the moments that compose a life, the common and repeated refrain becomes vanities. All is vanity. Stated differently, life is absurd, meaningless, and fleeting as vapor. I'm thinking that this preacher means for this phrase not to be taken as hyperbole because it's repeated a little less than 40 times. The preacher details the meaninglessness and the vanity that he sees in life. The people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of those who are to come. He says later on, there are righteous people who are treated according to the conduct of the wicked, and there are wicked people who are treated according to the conduct of the righteous. The righteous and the wise, their deeds are in the hands of God, and whether it is love or hate, one does not know. Perhaps harshest of all, the dead are luckier than the living, but the luckiest of all are those who had the sense enough not to be born at all. This is some pretty depressing stuff. But while this book may sound like a nihilist dream, the preacher does take one step back from that precipice. And that step comes in the form of recognizing that oddly enough, there is a sense of order to it all. God has set a rhythm of life a time and season for everything under the sun. He states, I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. And the overall conclusion, the overall conclusion despite the vanities the, seeming, the seemingly meaninglessness of it all. But still seeing that rhythm of life. The conclusion to go, eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your wine with a merry heart. Enjoy life with those whom you love. So maybe then, by the standards of this preacher wrestling with the meaning of life, maybe living the good life is knowing what time it is, but not being controlled by it. There are other ways of relating to time than that of the dominant culture in America. Travel to different parts of the world, to parts of Latin America, Africa, India, and the Middle East, and you'll see a relationship with time that is less of a tangible commodity. And time is more of a gift that is to be shared. These are cultures that tend to be less, less focused on the precise accounting of each and every moment and much more seeped in tradition and relationships rather than tasks. When I was in Palestine many years ago, our daily agenda had asterisks denoting that all times should be taken as approximate. This was because Palestinian culture did not hold timely arrivals or departures as the ultimate virtue, virtue to be had. And we learned a phrase, a phrase spoken across the Arabic speaking world, Insha'Allah, God willing. And to translate that into southern, simply add, and the creek don't rise. It's used to name that strong intention. An intention that is subject to uncommon, unforeseeable, and uncontrollable circumstances. It's almost as if naming that there exist forces that can easily derail our best laid plans that naming those forces gives us the permission to relax, not to worry, no need for stress, don't, don't force it, don't rush it. It will happen. 
Inshallah. God willing and the creek don't rise. But more than just expressing our intention, I see this Arabic phrase as a reminder of God's timing. Because we set our world to chronos time, the time that moves in one direction and is measured in precise increments. But God, God operates on kairos time, a kind of time that is qualitative and measured by experiences, relationships, and expectations. Insha'Allah reminds us that God willing, the earth continues to spin and seasons continue to change. And it is from that mindset that Ecclesiastes lays out 28 diametrically opposed seasons of life that we know to be true even without being able to fully measure. They are seasons that lay beyond our control. But don't think for a minute that acknowledging those seasons is the same thing as condoning them. Because that's just the way it is, is not a faithful response to the word. Indeed, there is a natural rhythm to life. There is a time to be born and for all of us a time to die. There is a time to plant and a time to harvest. That's how seasons of life go. And while we may not be able to fully control the other seasons, neither are we completely helpless. Because we can choose to sow the seeds of reason rather than the seeds of of discord. We can kill racism and white supremacy and work to heal the wounds these diseases have left on all people. We can mourn economic and educational systems that perpetuate inequity and dance when progress is finally made to reform them. We can refrain from embracing so that we can safely embrace later. We can seek a lasting peace by losing our stomachs for war. We can throw away our sense of shame and keep hold on to the knowledge that we are indeed loved. So y'all, Ecclesiastes speaks to us. This is truth. These are facts. The preacher calls us into the good life by calling us into God's time. For everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. God willing, inshallah, and the creek don't rise, we can discover new and ever richer meanings for these seasons of life. Because it's not all vanities. Your experiences are not meaningless. Our lives have purpose for today and for tomorrow. Closing in the words of an ancient Sanskrit poem, Yesterday is but a dream. Tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Friends, thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, as we prepare to settle ourselves into a prayerful space, I need to offer a long overdue word of gratitude for everyone who has continued to support the work of the church with your tithes and offerings. Friends, thank you. And for a faithful community kept strong and for a world made whole, I ask that you continue to support this church as we make our way together into a new future. Friends, let's pray. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. We now go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you knitted us in our mother's womb, created us in your very image, abided with us in each and every moment of our lives, and though our paths universally lead to death, you do not allow death to have the final say. In all seasons, Lord, hear our prayer. You have laid order over what was chaos, even though we fail to see your hand in the majesty of creation. We pray for the earth that yields our sustenance, that we would treat her with respect and work to end all that threatens the diversity of life that she bears. In all seasons, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for those who hurt and those who cause hurt, for those whose actions serve to unravel peace and community, and for those who tirelessly give of themselves so that others may find healing and wholeness. Especially today, we lift up the name of Jacob Blake, his children, and his community. In all seasons, Lord, hear our prayer. We join you, O God, in weeping with those who weep, mourning with those who mourn. So for all in the midst of grief over the loss of a loved one or the loss of a relationship, we pray. For those who are overstretched and at the end of their rope, we pray. And on the other side of the life experience, O God, we give you thanks for those blessed moments of laughter and wondrous spaces to dance. In all seasons, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, that you would build us up as a community, resilient in times of anxiety and hardship, and that you would guide us to let go of all unnecessary attachments so that we might see clearly and embrace the journey that is before us. In all seasons, Lord, hear our prayer. God, grant to each of us a discerning mind and a dedicated spirit, a mind that seeks knowledge and understanding, and a spirit that is ready to speak up and speak out against the forces of division in this world. Guide us, O oh God, to break down barriers and spread the seeds of compassion in all places. In all seasons, Lord, hear our prayer. We hold before you, O oh God, those whom we love and hold most dear. We pray especially for Tom Walsh, Ann Miller, Janet Baldwin, Susan Baldwin, Sharon Harrison, Charlotte Tidwell, and those we name in our hearts. Dear Lord, bless them, hold them, shower your love and grace upon them. In all seasons, Lord, hear our prayer. God, as we prepare to leave this time and space of worship, I pray that you would strengthen us to hate what is evil and hold fast to what is good. That we would love one another and rejoice in the hope held by our tomorrows. All these things and more we pray to you, our gracious and loving God. We hand them over to you with the words your son taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, beloved of God, through the wisdom of the ages, know that in all seasons God is present, and in so many we have the capacity to enact change. Life is beautiful and has meaning, especially when lived within God's time. So may the blessing of God, love, peace, and joy be with you today and throughout all of your tomorrows. Alleluia and amen.